かったそれがきつくて許したんだなるほどねどう I wanna stop even though I've already popped you ねえ Who cares? After a little recap of last week, we continued right where we left off with Shoma passed out in the park in need of sustenance. And unfortunately, the only thing he got was a gal, truly a being more terrifying than his entire alien race. From there, we got the opening to this series, which was pretty much what I expected in all the best ways. For starters, I did kind of like how the characters lip sync with the song to really highlight how this opening was pretty much their story. This song's lyrics in particular were pretty much the creed of the common Rider. Moments that are dazzling are being taken away, but they'll work to prevent that from happening anymore. They'll meet and part with many people to ensure their simple yet noble goal to put smiles on all those faces. They'll be sensitive to other people's needs, but not not their own. Really, all this just shows the selfless duties of the Kamen Rider that, as we saw with the previous episode, and we'll see with this one as well, is a very thankless job. That said, the actual melody to this song overall comes off as bubblier and more hopeful than some of these lyrics, which were very nicely shown through some cute graffiti-esque graphics to get across the more innocent and fun-loving nature of the characters, or more specifically Shoma himself. It continued for a while as the characters went through their odd jobs, which we'll see more of in this very episode. However, once we got to the lyrics about being sensitive to other people's needs, which was basically the signal that they needed to save the day, the villains of the show appeared, and the melody started to take an appropriate darker and more sinister tone to it. And once they sent out their faceless army of main the Abyss goons, Shoma Henshin, and started rider kicking the hell out of them. However, after the battle ended, we saw all of the main characters in depressed states, in particular Shoma, as he let out a scream to the heavens, likely in frustration over the difficulties of being a common rider. And from there, we got some rather bipolar visuals from dancing happily and then Shoma remembering his lost mom, then him bravely racing into battle on his bike, and in the end, reuniting with his friends against a setting sun. Yeah, I honestly can't describe this opening as anything other than just amazing. The lyrics are powerful in getting across this show and really the whole franchise's major themes of heroism while still being catchy as all hell. And the visuals really got across Shoma's struggles with accepting his role in stopping his own race from devouring humans. After Geats, this might actually be my second favorite opening of the Reiwa era riders. Anyway, Shoma soon arrived at the very modern apartments of this lady who we later learned was named Sachka. But yeah, while the architecture of this place was a little too hipstery for my personal taste, I'll give the set designers credit for making them very colorful and inviting. And as a result, it did contrast well when we cut over to the villains of the series, the Stomach family. Get it? With their very dark, drab, and overly industrial castle and factory where they made their people blocks. Yeah, by far one of the scariest parts of these guys was the fact that they treated their whole operation as just another business venture to really highlight how heartless they were over the fact that they were treating humans like livestock. And yet, in spite of being quite literal monsters, I do have to give credit that they did live in a pretty awesome alien world that kind of reminds me of the witch barriers from Monoko Magica in how they look like paintings and even turned into stencils when zooming out. That is just an awesome effect effect, and in general, this whole scene did an amazing job with its world building for the Grand Newt and establishing our villains, who also had some unique tummy mouths, kind of like our heroes. Hmm. Anyway, most of these guys are probably going to get more focused later, as the main villains of this episode, as well as probably next week, were these twins, Sheeta and Jeeb. And at first, I did want to make a Nye and Mare comparison, but then I noticed Jeeb's Adam's apple. Yep, we've got a trap in this house, and judging by the fact that Cheetah was a bit of a pants-wearing tomboy, I get more of an Aura and Mae vibes from Overlord from them. How much you want to bet it's gonna cause quite the little uproar on Twitter X later. <laughs> 
back with Shoma, he created a few more gold soul by eating more gummies and chips, and yet when he ate actual food from a bento, nothing came out. This would be basically explained later in the episode, though from a meta standpoint, I think we all know they're just sticking with the most marketable products in junk food to sell their toys. Whatever, as at least we know that Shoma will at least eat some real food, and this show isn't encouraging nothing but junk food. Hell, they've encouraged brushing after eating, so they're all good. Anyway, they also earlier established that Sachka ran an odd jobs company with their job for that day being moving. Shoma decided to help to make up for everything she had done for him. Oh. Somewhere, Taro Momoi is sulky in a quarter because somebody hogged all the relationships from him. Meanwhile, Hanto was investigating Gav with his mentor. Oh wait, why is he still alive? Yeah, okay, so as many pointed out last week, I was mistaken thinking the mentor and the monster of that week were the same person. My bad, as I just assumed when they cut from one bespeckled man to another that they'd be the same guy. I will still say, this guy does come off weird to me, and I do hope they do something more with him to justify his existence. I mean, I think most of us already know what sort of role Hanto is going to play, but more on that when the time is right. Anyway, his investigations led him to Hajime and his Karen mom, who of course was still ungrateful to the superhero who saved their lives, with even her son standing up for him. Back with said thankless hero, he had a nice exchange with Sachka, where he revealed where he got his love of snack foods from. As it turned out, it was from his mother, who, based on the fact that she was taken by the Grand Mute, of course meant that she was human, and thus, since by living amongst the alien species, she refused to resort to cannibalism, and craved earth foods like potato chips. She passed on these stories to her son, that likely filled him with high expectations that, when fulfilled by eating the stuff, produced the goat souls. For Shoma, they represent his connection with his human mother. Which, by the way, if she gave birth to a half Grand Mute, then what exactly was the process of reproducing with a species that have tentacles in their stomach? Don't ask! For God's sake, don't ask! Nah, anyway, a uh, heartwarming scene where Sachka gave Shoma a notebook to take log of all the foods he enjoyed. Shoma also introduced himself as Shoma Inoue, taking his mother's maiden name as his actual surname was Probably a spoiler. And they further had a nice moment where Shoma admitted that he admired Sachka for her simple form of heroism in helping others for a fee. <laughs> well, you know what the Joker says. If you're good at something, never do it for free. We live in an age where that guy makes the most sense. That night, the thankfully more distinct monster of the week ended up attacking the person they helped move in, Ritsu. The Shoma went to save her, and after some sloppy yet effective fighting, he was reminded of how heartless his race was towards humans, legit angering him to the point that he just went ham on this Cthulhu wannabe. Certainly a cool moment to show off his heroism, but he still needed to defeat the guy, so he ended up trying out one of his new buddies. The Zakuzaku chip form was pretty much best described by Koshtan when it came to its sturdiness. The armor, and even the swords, were very brittle, but if used the right way, or more specifically, like actual swords, they could be deadly weapons. Basically, the key is to use this upper part of the sword, which is pretty much what every kendo instructor ever will tell you. So, using his new form that was the very definition of a glass cannon, Shoma defeated the baddie, though he did give him the option to stop working for the Stomach family that he didn't take. This is of course meant to show that he was aware of the fact that he was offing members of half of his heritage for the betterment of the other half, but it couldn't be helped. Men hey, as long as the kind humans that he was protecting were safe, then it's all good and... I just love how beautifully tragic this show is. As he was leaving, Shoma ended up passing by Hanto, whom we also ended up learning the reason why he was looking for him was because a grand mute who kind of looked like Gav took away his mother, which I'm sure won't play into anything later. And the episode ended with Shoma once again fulfilling that meeting and parting with many lyric from his opening as she left Sachka's apartments before she could check in on him. After the first episode introduced a lot of things for the show, you'd think they'd slow down just a little, and they didn't, and honestly, I'm kind of grateful for that. 
I mean, sure, there wasn't quite as many emotional highs as last week, but there was just as much, if not more, world and character building, which is almost always a plus in my book. It's great stuff that's promising a much more intricate tale than what you might expect from a show about a superhero who eats candy. For any superhero show, it is important to establish your heroes and villains as early and as thoroughly as possible. In the case of this episode, we did get a good look at the main villain faction of the Stolmok family and their goals. Stuff like just seeing the world they came from really helps to give us a scale of how grand this conflict may end up becoming. This is then appropriately contrasted with Shoma's simpler everyman life that he wanted to protect from half of his lineage, which going by the fact that he hid his surname might connect him a little more with the Stolmogs in certain ways. But yeah, seeing the contrast between him happily taking on odd jobs with Sachka and then fighting a thankless battle as Gav really highlighted the difficulties of being a common rider, and yet also sowed some hopeful seeds for the future that does await him as long as he keeps to his morals. It's also good that they established his powers of creating goat souls, as well as of course the power set of Gav with forms that have pros and cons to them like his samurai chip form. And overall, this is just another really good and effective episode in further building the characters and world of the show. Potato chips might not make the best armor, but at least our hero's spirit remains unbreakable for now. Thank you for watching, as well as for the bunch of new subs we got for just reviewing this new show. I know I'm still kind of new to reviewing this particular franchise, and we'll probably make even dumber mistakes later, but I'm just glad that y'all are enjoying what we're making now, and whatever will come in the future, hopefully. Look forward to it, and until then though, for now my friends, and uh... Yeah, I think I need to go get a glass of water.